Hey, True Believers, Englantine here. Something I want to start is, you know, I, I, I like these, uh, I like these word plays. Ten for Tuesday. <laughs> In this case, uh, it's going to be top ten, and we're talking about uh, top ten great books from, or ten great books from the 1980s. Some of them lived and died in the 1980s. You may have never heard of these. I hope if you haven't that you give these a try. They're awesome. This is why my teen years were awesome. <laughs> and uh, I have one rule. No Dark Knight, no Watchmen. Everybody knows they're great. They're a given. They're a default. And they, to me, they're a cheat on a list, basically. People put them there. You know that you're only going to you, you're only gonna get eight because you know these two are on the list. So I said, nope, they're not there. So here you go. Ten other books that are great from the 1980s. And in all honesty, I have another list ready for next week. But that's going to be my Tuesday thing. I'm going to do top 10 lists and first 10 lists, talking about the first 10 books of a given series. So uh, without further ado, let's get this party started. Number 10, The Badger, created by Mike Barron. Yeah, Norbert Sykes, man. Back in the day when we all thought that every Vietnam veteran was just a hair trigger away from destroying everything and everyone on the street that they lived, here comes Norbert Sykes, Vietnam veteran who could talk to animals and was a very violent martial artist. This is a violent book for the time, anyway. And, of course, he was a Wolverine ripoff. At the time, everybody was trying to get one. You know, they, he was a big character. What you going to do? And in this case, yeah, man, uh, I think it was produced by Capital and then by First. And I know there have been revival attempts, but uh, he never really caught on. And I think he should have. This is a good book. You should give this one a try. Number nine, The Elementals, created by Bill Willingham, you know, from Fables fame. Anyway, actually, Fathom, Fathom is still around from this book. This is a story, this guy, his name's Lord Saker, he creates this uh, machine that takes over the supernatural elements of the Earth. So the actual elementals decide to find hosts that have been killed by their element to fight them. It is really good. I would put the first six issues of this comic book up against damn near anything from the 1980s. I mean, it is really good, man. A little bit violent, but I'm very happy at least one of the characters have survived through, through, the, uh, through time. Anyway, check this one out, too. Number eight, The Jack of Hearts by Bill Mantelo. Man, I, I was pretty impressed by this one. Oh, and uh, George Freeman. I should include him, too. That's the artist. Yeah, I love my first introduction to the whole comic book trope about how the superpowers can kill the, the person who has them. And you find out so much information about this guy that I had no idea about. I mean, I wasn't a reader of Deadly Hands of Kung Fu. That's where he made his first appearance in number 22. And it, so I didn't know anything about him. And all of a sudden, I'm reading this four-issue miniseries, and I really get to know this guy because they tell you everything you need to know. And by the end, you're like, I don't want him to die. But yeah, you got to check this book out. Seriously. It may be a cliche, but this is an emotional roller coaster, man. Number seven, Frank Miller's Ronin. Holy Toledo. How to describe this one? Okay, so you got a samurai. His name's Samurai. I don't think they ever gave him a name. And he is in, of course, feudal Japan. And he loses his master because, uh, what was it, a demon? Oh my gosh, I'm trying to remember. It's been a while. Um, <laughs> but anyway, they get transported into the future, into a dystopian future, as they call them nowadays. And there they meet Billy, who is a limbless telekinetic who somehow is psychically linked with the Ronin. And my gosh, we say Frank Miller was crazy now. He was crazy back then. This is a book you can't really describe. You just say, read it. You'll love it. You know, and, and just hope people trust you enough to check it out, <laughs> which I'm doing right now. No, it's got that same sort of uh, Frank Miller good bad art, and back back then it was like it, this is all before Sin City got a hold of him, and you got to appreciate Frank Miller before Sin City, man. It it was a damn good story, a lot of fun, but holy Toledo, was it bat crazy, man? Seriously, I liked this story. This was cool. This was original, especially for the day, man. I mean, we just didn't see this kind of stuff. Anyway, check it out. Oh, Agat, Agat, wasn't that the name? Agat, Agat was the name of the demon or something I just remembered? Yeah, wow, what a bat, I'm, I'm gonna read this again, this is really good. Number six, Amazing Man. I get 
weird looks when I try to tell people how good this book is, man. Seriously. And these days it would be called a slice o' life kind of story. That's what it is. There's no real superheroics. He does save somebody or a kid from uh, getting hit by a car in the first issue. But yeah, it's it's basically this guy. He's crazy and dresses like a superhero. He wants to be a superhero and all of his friends and his neighbors and everything just let him go and because he's a nice guy. And this book is funny. It, that's that's what really holds this thing up. The humor, it, it's just incredible. It's a really well-written book. The side characters are drawn out. You uh, get to know this neighborhood. And they did get Frank Miller for the last issue. What are you going to do? He was hot at the time. Anyway, you could get these for like a dollar off eBay. You should. Check it out. Number five, the Cloak and Dagger miniseries. Their four-issue miniseries. Now, I like Cloak and Dagger's characters, or at least their potential. I like them in their appearances in Peter Parker's Spectacular Spider-Man before this. And I always wish and hope that their miniseries or any series that they do is going to be awesome. However, this is the only time they've been great. They've been good, but this is the only time they've been great. And this, like, once uh, once again, it's written by Bill Montalo. This was some serious stuff, man. It dealt with a lot of stuff. It dealt with runaways. It dealt with drug use. Uh, they were kidnapped, and that's how they got their powers, kidnapped and experienced uh, on with the uh, with the drugs and such. Unfortunately, Marvel was stout, and then in their regular series right here made them mutants because I figured they thought kids were dumb enough to think, wait a second, if I do drugs, I get superpowers? I have to try that. Which, come on, Marvel, what a freaking cop-out. Seriously? This was ridiculous. And no, I didn't care for their series. It was okay. It was okay, but it was nothing, nothing like the miniseries. It just did not hold a candle. Anyway, let's get back to that. One of the better things about Cloak and Dagger, and I understand characters evolve and such, but was the fact that they needed each other, or at least uh, da- Cloak needed Dagger, you know, for, for her light. And I don't know. It just seemed like there was a sense of desperation and such around them. It's a really deeper, it's a much deeper story than you would think would come out of a 1980s comic book. I don't know. Bill Mantelo apparently is in higher regard than I would have originally given him credit for. Number four, Dazzler. Yes, you knew she was going to come out at some point in time on this list. You had to have, right? Anyway, oh man, I love this freaking book. This was so much fun. And I'm one of the few people who actually loved this book. It was hot for a little bit and then quickly died. <laughs> I think by the time she took on Galactus, that that kind of was a jumping the shark moment for it. But this is Marvel before Marvel became paramilitary. Like everybody's talking about, oh, we're going on missions. Oh, we're so, you know. Yeah, this was just, let's do superhero for superhero's sake and have a good time. The Blue Shield was in there. She took on Doctor Doom, too. (laughs) What a silliness. What a bunch of silliness this was. Her second issue was against the Enchantress, and she's having a concert, and all the superheroes show up to help fight the Enchantress. It's so entertaining. So much fun. That's all I can say about this book. It's just thoroughly enjoyable. One through 40 and get the mini, or or the uh, Marvel graphic novel. It's essential. It is essential to her story back then. All right? Uh, Do not expect anything deep. Just expect a lot of fun superhero looks from the 1980s that is unpretentious. Good times. 3-0. It's a magic number. Crisis on Infinite Earths. Man, let me tell you something. What a great time to be a comic book collector the 1980s. Now, this came along at a perfect time. I was always in for the the comic book stories, but of course you start to grow up, you want to get a little more nuance, you want to get some actual tension, some actual story to it, and this is like a miniseries that said, hold on England teen, we're going to consolidate everything, we're going to make it more uh, more palatable to you, it's going to be awesome, you're going to enjoy this, but first you got to go through this awesome 12 issue miniseries here, and holy Toledo the impact I got to admit I didn't know most of the people that were getting killed in the beginning of it it wasn't until later when you see like the flash get killed that I was like holy Toledo they just killed the flash and while you know everybody mentions the Supergirl stuff but to me flash had more impact I mean he was dead for dang near 20 years you know until the 2000s and frankly I think they should have kept him dead he was better martyr than he was a hero anyway but holy the impact of this story alone 
is something that I think is amazing. And unfortunately, they tried to undo it all with the new 52. Uh, this was the best time from from the, uh, I, I would have to say, from Crisis all the way up to new 52 is the best time in DC Comics history. Fight me. You'll lose. I'm right about this. Uh, and, and damn, what a great story. It's wordy, but it's worth it. Number two. The New Teen Titans by George Perez and Marv Wolfman. Particularly in this instance, I'm going to talk about the first 40 or so issues. This is when you had them fight the Justice League. This is the Trigun. Uh, Shoot, that was what? Number five, I think? They met Trigun. The first appearance of Deathstroke. You have so many. And that's not even mentioning the Judas contract. One of my personal favorites is a nice simple story where Wally West is writing to his parents and he's telling about uh, things that happened to him. It was intense. It was fun. Who Killed Trident was a great story. There are some really good books here, man. Seriously. This was one of my favorite series of all time. And granted, this is back in the day when I might, may have been a little bit more influenced you know, by what I was reading. I was younger. What you going to do? But this hit at the perfect time. While a lot of people were naming the X-Men as their, uh, as their favorite, I was naming Teen Titans. I just dug them. I just, I dug this series. Raven was awesome to me. Starfire, of course, put any 13-year-old boy through the ringer. <laughs> but, oh my gosh, what a fun series this was. And that first appearance of Deathstroke was really cool. But it was the second one, in issue number 10, where they deal with like a, the, a toy maker of sorts. It was just so freaking weird that I, I enjoyed this. I, this is where I also met Captain Carrot and the zoo crew. Blackfire right here was awesome. The story of uh, Starfire's twi- sister and um, also met the Doom Patrol in this one. This uh, this got me into a lot of DC Comics. Anyway, I know I'm, I'm, I'm really just talking about a whole bunch of personal reasons and not... Um, come on, it's George Perez art. You got Marv Wolfman writing. It's definitely worth a look. And the number one reason comic books were better in the 80s than they are now, for at least this video, because there's a ton I've left off, is Marvel's Assistant Editor's Month. Beware, it's Assistant Editor's Month. Don't say we didn't warn you. This is back when Marvel had fun, man. They weren't about the message. They were about the story. They were about the audience. They were about the crowd. The people who loved Marvel Comics, they loved the people who loved Marvel Comics. At least that's the feeling you got. And man, they took chances putting... The, the Avengers on David Letterman turning the Red Skull into Modoc. Holy Toledo, they were just fun books. This is actually a prelude to Dazzler's graphic novel, uh, Dazzler the Movie. It is so much fun. Fred Hembeck in Peter Parker's Spectacular Spider-Man. Fred Hembeck was always a ton of fun. And that's something that Marvel's forget. Okay, this is crap. This is crap. This is one. They can't all be winners. And unfortunately, Daredevil in Savages was, that was a crap story. But the thing is, is Marvel knew how to have fun back then. And even when they weren't having fun, man, they did some good stories. Oh, well, you want to talk about fun. Aunt May and Franklin Richards, uh, or Twinkies, yo, Twinkies, yo, Twinkies, save the day. <laughs> the golden oldie. Oh, this is one of my favorite stories, as a matter of fact. Uh, the thing goes into Marvel offices because he's mad. There's this, the whole issue is a big knockdown drag out with this guy called Goody Two Shoes or something like that. And thing comes in and goes, let me tell you how it really happened is like one panel fight where the thing just brushes them off. It's so much fun. So really, seriously, a good time. Um, yeah, I mean, damn, Marvel Assistant Editors Month. You would never think that they would actually enjoy it this much. And even if they did, it would be something where they try to put some sort of politics, an orange man bad, you know, into it. They just don't know how to enjoy themselves or to how to show Marvel fans that they still appreciate them anymore. And it wasn't all joke books. The Trial of Reed Richards was an amazing story by John Burton. Man, okay, so... Here you have a Galactus coming to Earth, and he's dying, and Reed Richards saves him. But then Galactus goes off and destroys the homeworld. So the Shi'ar come in, and they kidnap 
Reed Richards to make him stand trial for the death of the Skrull planet. It was an amazing story, and it was told during the Assistant Editor's Month. This right here, of course, Tony Stark, this is when he was uh, dealing with his alcoholism, but there is a group of kids that worship the Avengers and had a, an Avengers club where they all dressed up like their favorite Avenger. And since Iron Man was no longer a part of the Avengers, they kicked out their friend who dressed like Iron Man. And it kind of mirrored it as the kid goes off and he gets into like soda pop and candy and isolation running with a bad crowd the whole nine yards. And it's just... It deals with the hero worship. What do you do? What does a kid do when his hero has fallen? And it's an amazing story. And then you have the kid who collected Spider-Man. Once again, it's an, it's a, an assistant editor's month book. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is considered one of, if not the best, Spider-Man tale ever told. So, yeah, wow. Assistant Editor's Month got it just brought us a lot of great stories. It brought us a lot of you know, heartfelt, a lot of funny, and a lot of fun stories. Something that makes you proud to be a comic collector and something I would never see them doing today, in all honesty. Marvel, you've lost your way, and this right here proves it. But that's my opinion. What is yours? I know I've left off a whole bunch of stuff. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I've got 10 more uh, ready to go next week for next week's top 10. So anywho, uh, if you do like the video, please click like, click share, get word out about the channel. Don't forget to hit subscribe. And if you haven't done it already, the notification bell. That's what YouTube really cares about, and I'd hate for you to miss anything. Cool things happen around these parts. Also... If you don't mind helping out the channel, go on over to Patreon or to Ko-Fi. Drop a dollar in the till. Helps keep the lights on. Helps keep making videos for you, especially since they stopped my live stream. It'd be nice. I mean, yeah, just go drop some in the tip jar. I've got a PayPal as well. I'd like to thank everybody who's already done that. And to everyone, all of the true believers, thank you very, very much for watching.